point of this session is to give the people who've done particular areas of work, uh, housing and health and long-term care, who produce big reports, uh, big fat reports, uh, lots of reading for you to do. And now we want to give them the opportunity, as with John and Ruth earlier on, just to focus you on the key points they would like to come across from these bigger bits of work. And we're going to begin with Becky Tunstall, who is Roundtree Professor of Housing Policy at York University and was previously with us. So we're good to see her back doing this, uh, as she has been throughout the period of this program. And then Polly Vizard, who will be talking to us about health. And then Tanya, who will be doing the long-term care, social care bit that links across with health, of course. And we're going to be giving them 10 minutes uh, each, apart from Polly, who has given the fatness of her contribution, uh, <laughs> 15 minutes. Um, and then I want to keep them quite hard to that because I want you to have the opportunity to give your views, reactions, and pursue them with some questions. So without further ado, uh, Becky. Thank you very much, Al. <coughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming along. I'm going to talk very briefly and at high speed about housing. Um, before I get started, um, people who work in housing always make this point, that housing has a slightly particular um, position within social policy in that it's never been fully incorporated into um, government responsibility. Um, in, in this context as well, it's also peculiarly vulnerable as a capital-intensive service to cuts in times of uh, fiscal co um, constraint. Um, and also it's very hard to say where housing policy ends and where um, the housing policy shifts over into a macroeconomic policy, into planning policy, into employment policy and so on. So given all of that, let's go for 10 minutes. Um, so um, what, were the, what were the goals of the coalition government when they came in? Well, there was quite a lot of thinking about housing policy um, before the Conservative um, uh, and, and Liberal Democrat um, coalition came together. So both parties had thought quite a lot about the, what they wanted to do. And those who became um, ministers under the coalition had quite a substantial and, and comprehensive view about the housing system in that they agreed with the assessment that had been made by academics and other policymakers and commentators over the previous decade that there were system, um, systematic problems with the British housing system. Uh, it was dysfunctional, there was persistent market failure, to, to quote the first um, coalition housing minister's own words. Um, and there were problems that had, had gone on for a long um, period of time with insufficient supply, affordability issues, inequalities, regional differences, a whole catalogue of really difficult problems that would be difficult to deal with at any time, particularly in a cold climate. Um, but nonetheless, um, housing goals were placed um, subordinate to um, other goals, and particularly the, the focus on the economy and dealing with the deficit. So there was quite an um, ambitious diagnosis of the problem. I would argue that um, housing then got squashed when it came to thinking about uh, policy making more broadly. And when you look at the actual policy goals of the, the coalition, they're fairly traditional. So some of the really tough issues, like should we continue to support home ownership, um, given that it's shrinking, given that its relationship to the labour market, and given its relationship with asset development, savings, the wider economy has been problematic. Um, some of those were mm, fudged, and we have a fairly traditional set of housing policy goals which are about increasing supply, helping people into home ownership, general improvements across tenures, and then links with other areas of policy as well. So detailed policies, I think it's worth talking about the non-policies and also the policies that are enacted by um, other agencies. So um, we've heard from the main presentations that the bulk of changes that have gone on in the coal climate um, period, the coalition period, have been about um, changes to expenditure rather than taxation. <coughs> and there's this nagging question that some, some of the respondents raised about um, tax policy. <coughs> a little done, a little change to the tax position of housing, but I predict that will be something we'll be looked at more intensively in future. 
And it's also worth bearing in mind that um, the low interest rate policy introduced by the Bank of England to deal with the, um, as a reaction to the, the um, problems in the, the housing market and the, the wider economy before the coalition came in, and were maintained throughout this period and form a very important context of what went on. <coughs> so some details on policy. Um, you know, housing people will love to talk in a great deal of, of detail about the ins and outs, um, but just a, a few um, major things to talk about. Big changes to the planning system. So the abolition of regional planning, um, the abolition of house building targets, um, new aspects to the planning system with the empowerment of neighbourhoods and, and local groups. Um, a series of schemes to um, kickstart house building that got stuck um, during the recession itself. Um, a return to enthusiasm for the right to buy, um, the 30 year old policy that was reinvigorated with bigger discounts. Major um, advance on what had already been um, initiated under the Labour government in response to the crisis with um, financial support for people to get into to buying. Big changes to housing benefit as part of welfare reforms. Um, reductions to supporting people budgets as part of the changes in, in local authority <coughs> expenditure. But probably, so that's a sort of mixed bag of things that are aiming at different bits of the housing system and, and different bits of the housing problem. But I'm just going to highlight a few which I think um, form important precedents which affect the housing welfare safety net. And again, this is um, a link back to one of the major themes that Ruth highlighted um, in, in, in terms of the package of policies overall. So, um, be, it's often argued the housing welfare safety net has got three elements. Social housing, um, the provision for people who lose their housing through homelessness legislation and support, and housing benefit. And each of those had substantial changes, which in, do build on what's gone on before under other governments, but have really established quite substantial precedents. So affordable housing, you can argue that, they, that the, the idea of social housing has gone um, forever with a new form of uh, subsidy uh, targeted at um, new housing on much higher rents than the traditional for um, social housing. Other things, a little subsidy for new house building, and the idea that social landlords can provide five-year rather than um, permanent or ongoing tenancies. Next change to homelessness. Um, again, building on um, some changes introduced under Labour, but local authorities can discharge their duties to homeless households by helping them into the private rented sector. Big change on Labour. Under Labour, um, this could happen, but only if uh, residents agree to it. Now the situation is that local authorities can give you some help and then uh, that is the end of their role. Uh, they don't have to give you uh, permanent social housing if you're interested in it. And finally, housing benefit. Big changes as part of all the welfare reforms affecting those in social housing and those in the private renting, obviously both those in work and those out of work. But payments are increasingly often less than the actual cost of rent for people on a minimal income equivalent to being on out of work benefits. By a whole range of things, the very well-known um, uh, bedroom tax but changes that affect private renting and the benefits cap as well. So I'm now going to talk about spending. Probably used up about nine of my minutes, but there's still things to look at here. So overall government spending on housing in the UK fell by 35% over the coalition period. That sounds like an enormous drop, and it is one of the biggest drops in departmental spending if you look across the other areas. But I thought it was important to put that in context and to recognise that that built on a period of substantial growth in spending on housing, particularly in the, the last Labour government. <coughs> so if you look at that in more detail, spending on new um, social and affordable house building fell by 44%, um, and the cuts were concentrated in, in England. The, the governments of um, the nations were able to protect spending to some extent in their areas. Um, so, just looking back, the housing minister said in 2010 <coughs> when he came in that housing must take its share of the burden in terms of uh, deficit reduction. But, as has happened in previous eras, um, housing is, because it's so capital intensive, is, it's an easier, quicker place to make cuts than some other departments, and so housing has taken far more than its share in, in numerical terms. But that's not the whole story, um, as, as, as we've seen in other areas, um, it, it, it's quite complex. So expenditure has increased in two parts of housing spending. If you include housing benefit as part of housing expenditure, it 
expenditure. It's, it's a very, very important element to overall. And despite all the efforts at welfare reform, and despite the, the huge amount of policy effort that's been back and forth about things like the bedroom tax, um, housing benefit spending actually rose over this period. And that's due to there being large numbers of claimants and the average claim being higher as well, as rents have gone up and people have been more in the private rented sector than social renting. And another area of, of major expenditure, which is harder to calculate because it's about um, offering guarantees and putting the government money up at risk, so we'll only know the final cost of this in, in the future, um, the Help to Buy program. But expenditure on that, as we currently measure it, has, has not um, constituted any sort of additional expenditure. And overall, the pattern is um, reductions in spending that are quite substantial. Outcomes, moving on very quickly. Um, the Department of Communities and Local Government set itself seven targets for housing policy in England, and there was progress on more than half of those. Um, so uh, new home starts, um, planning and energy efficiency, but um, less progress on others. But if we go back to look at the Coalition's broader housing goals, and um, we don't want to get too focused on targets, and that's something the Coalition itself has talked about, I think you can argue that it achieved no significant or unambiguous successes on its broader goals. And there is an issue here about things being uh, you know, early to say. Um, but uh, if you look at some of the, the, the policies that are in place, a lot of ambiguity about what will happen. You know, the planning changes, you can argue that they will enable development, also they will constrain development. Certainly in the short term, they're creating uncertainty and not led to um, any significant uh, boom in, in, in growth. Again, help to buy. Um, lots of concern about whether it's actually adding to systemic risk. Um, lots of questioning about whether it's adding to the assistance um, and, and um, really uh, what the cost will be long term. So on all of these issues, concern and questions, um, you know, there is less funding for housing support for older and vulnerable people than there was. It's hard to argue as yet that the welfare system has become more simple and the, the impact of housing benefit on people's work incentives and the changes that we've seen, it ambiguous. <coughs> so... Just to say a little bit about distribution, the winners over the system this period, and there have been plenty of housing winners and people who've done well, people with flexible rate um, mortgages who were able to take advantage of lower um, interest rates have done extremely well over this time period. Um, if you look broadly though, um, coalition policies in housing appear to be a best neutral and in, in um, some areas are markedly regressive because the areas where there were substantial spending cuts on social housing, on um, housing budgets of local authorities, are areas where you would expect that expenditure to be going towards people at the lower end of the income scale and people more disadvantaged. The clear losers include younger people, new households, tenants, benefit claimants, and so on. And then just to come up with a, a sort of summary of where we are, the climate is still chilly, and that's very true in housing. Um, it's difficult to envisage any future government making any major changes to the um, expenditure cuts that have gone on. And perhaps the biggest issue is those systemic problems identified by the coalition before its members came to power are still with us. So we've still got these problems of low housing supply, affordability and so on. They, the changes that are made to the welfare safety net in terms of housing mean that there's no more risk now spread around through society <coughs> rather than held by the state and local government. We're in a position where government is going to have to do more, but it's got less money and less power to do it, given that there's been um, a push of power down to local authorities and other agencies to some extent. But some of those agencies are under pressure. For example, there's quite a, you know, there's a, there's a limit to what the nation's housing associations can do. There's a limit to how much money they can borrow on the stock that they have. And there will, will come a point that without subsidy, they cannot um, you know, build any further. So the climate is still chilly. And to some extent, some of the real major housing problems have just been kicked along the road. I'll leave you there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, can still be kicked along the road, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, now, Polly's going to take us through her piece on health. So, Polly, over to you. Yes, um, thank you very much. Yes, this is health, and it's joint work with Polina, who's here and did a lot of the work. So, 
Um, so I hope I'm not going to fixate on the money, but I am starting with the money. Um, so the Coalition Agreement and Programme for Government um, explicitly um, committed to increasing real spending on health in each year of this Parliament. Um, that pledge notably um, was in cash terms, real cash terms, um, so adjusted for inflation, but not relative to need or demand. So it is true to say that the Coalition protected health relative to other expenditure areas. But growth in real spending has been exceptionally low um, by the standards of previous governments. In fact, we need an estimated 1.2 to 1.5% increases annually just to keep pace with demographic changes. And the average annual growth rates have been lagging behind that and also behind other simple indicators of need and demand in this period. So just to bring that out, this table um, provides information on public expenditure on health by political administration. And looking at the annual average growth rates, the historical trend over the period 1950 to 51 um, to the end of the Labour years, 2009-10, was 4% annually. That um, comprised of um, rates of 3.3% annually under the Conservatives up to 1996-7, with a low during the second Thatcher administration of 2.4% annually. Um, under Labour, that figure um, jumped up to 5.7% as additional resources were pumped into the NHS. Um, but the blue block at the bottom is the coalition years. And you can see that for the UK, for the period 2009-10 to 2013-14, um, we have an annual average growth rate um, of 0.7%, so less than 1% annually. Um, if we look at the English figure separately, we get a figure of 0.9%, so marginally higher, but this is really marginal. Um, if we bring in um, plans um, up to 2014-15, and also if we shift to the budgeting framework, um, that's used in the Comprehensive Spending Review. So the rest of these figures rely on the UN classification of expenditure by function. But if we shift to the budgeting framework, we get a figure of 0.8%. So you can see that any way we cut um, the data, um, average annual growth rates have been exceptionally low by historical standards and the standards of previous governments. These um, next few graphs bring this out a bit more. So they, they look at growth rates of real expenditure of health and how that compared to a series of simple indicators of need and demand. Um, so this first one plots real growth in public expenditure on health, real growth in volume expenditure on health, which adjusts for the NHS-specific um, inflation rather than general inflation, and real growth in GDP. And you can see that the growth in real expenditure on health, which is the blue line, um, and the orange line, the volume expenditure, both lagged what we know, behind what we know is a very modest increase in real GDP over the period. If we look at that in per capita terms, so we take population growth into account, we can see a similar pattern, but the growth rate's getting even lower. So in fact, the blue line this time, the real growth in public expenditure on health per capita, flat lines, there was no growth. This, these are index numbers, and we started 100 in 2009-10, and we end up at 100 in 2013-14. Um, if we look at the volume expenditure per capita, we actually get a, a fall. Um, so the index goes down to 99, um, starting again at 100. And again, both of those curves are lagging behind the real um, growth in GDP per head. And we can look at various other indicators like growth of 85s and over 65s, and we can see that the growth in real expenditure on health and volume expenditure on health is lagging behind those. So how did the UK do um, comparatively? So internationally, um, many countries during this period have been restructuring their health systems um, in broader attempts to grapple with deficits and debts. And the OECD comparative data that allows us to compare expenditure in different countries focuses on total expenditure. This, this brings in private sector as well as public expenditure. Um, it's true to say that the ratio of total health expenditure to GDP, um, which was targeted under Labour and narrowed, um, up to 2010 has been under pressure in this period. It hasn't massively widened, but it, there's signs of it being under pressure. Um, An OECD analysis also suggests that the decline in average growth rates in per capita total health expenditure between 2009 and 12 were really rather big in comparative terms in the UK. Um, so this 
figure here um, is an OECD figure which brings that point out. It's annual average growth rates in per capita health expenditure. Um, the light blue bars are for 2000 to 2009 and they show positive annual increases, quite large in, in number of countries. Um, these, these are EU 28 countries over the period 2000 to 2009. Um, then we have the crisis and by 2010 um, there's a squeeze on financial resources going to health in many countries. Um, so these are the dark blue bars, and you can see in about half EU 28 countries, there's a reduction, so the annual growth rate becomes much smaller, and in the other half, it actually becomes negative. Um, so for the EU 28 as a whole, um, these are the red bars. We've got a figure of minus 0 0.6. Um, the UK's um, figure is minus 1.3, so it's not as bad as the worst case scenario. Over there on the left, that's Greece with a minus 9 um, figure. Um, but on the other hand, there's a number of European countries that manage to retain positive growth, albeit smaller growth, for example, France, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to skip over policies, um, which have been very intensive, as you know. Maybe that will come up in the discussion. Um, outcomes. As we heard earlier, there's um, a number of indicators that are pointing towards increasing pressure on our healthcare access and quality. Um, key point is that it's not just A&E that we've um, heard a lot about, um, but it's also patient experience of access to GPs, waiting times for hospital treatment, waiting times for cancer treatment, for first treatment after a serious referral from a doctor, patient experience of mental health, public satisfaction with the NHS. All of those have shown signs of adverse movements against those indicators. Um, suicide and mental health, um, though we, we did highlight those, um, that was quite correct um, as we heard in the session earlier, um, and they have remained more prevalent, problem, have mental health problems and suicide um, since the economic crisis and downturn. Um, so this could be also a sign of increasing need after the crisis, health need. <coughs> And if we think about the social determinants approach that was put forward by Michael Marmot in the review in 2010, um, and that's reflected in the new public health outcomes framework, which I think is a very positive development, um, that really emphasises the importance of social indicators such as poverty, inequality, unemployment, domestic violence, housing conditions and so forth for health. And we might expect from that model that in a time of downturn and crisis, um, we might have increasing health need. At the end of it, this period, or at least um, on the basis of the latest data that um, we have, health inequalities have remained deeply entrenched. Um, so whether we look at life expectancy or healthy life expectancy or potential years lost or mortality from the major killers, such as circulatory, respiratory and cancer, or liver diseases, infant mortality, obesity, physical exercise or smoking, you name the indicator, there's a very um, clear social gradient um, on the latest data there's not been much progress in addressing that um, in recent years. Um, the UK's ranking on OECD international tables, perhaps as a result of those underlying inequalities, has remained very disappointing for some health outcomes on the latest data, um, including female life expectancy, where we're in fact ranked 23 out of 32 OECD countries. Um, so just a couple of graphs relating to some of those comments. Um, or tables. Um, first of all, this is suicide. Uh, this is mental health problems, um, but, and the change um, in the risk of poor mental health over the period 2008 to 2012. Um, so that top um, highlighted bit in that red circle shows that there's been a two percent increase um, in overall um, risk of poor mental health between 2008 and 2012. Um, the circle underneath that shows that um, that's particularly um, true of middle-aged um, people. Um, that's the figures for men and women combined. If we look at them separately, the increases have been particularly notable for um, women. Um, that's true of younger women aged 16 to 24, as well as the um, middle-aged groups that I just highlighted. And the poorest may have been um, most affected um, by some of these changes. So. Um, this table um, gives risk of more poor mental health by um, equivalent household income um, quintiles. And we can see for 2012, the first column, that um, people from the lowest income quintile um, had considerably, substantially higher poor mental health risk than those from the highest quintile. 
And looking at the next column, we can also see that the change between 2008 and 2012 has been particularly marked within that lowest quintile group. So at the end of the period, inequalities in life expectancy have remained deeply embedded, and I'm not sure if you can see this graph very clearly, but it, it shows um, the gap in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy um, between people living in the most deprived areas and the least deprived areas, and life expectancy is um, considerably substantially higher um, in the least deprived areas as, as is healthy um, life expectancy. And at the bottom, we have the range or the absolute inequality, the gap. Um, so, for example, for men in the context of life expectancy, we have a gap of nine years. And um, for healthy life expectancy for men, we have a gap of 18 years. And um, the, two, the two columns give the um, change um, in that gap between 2009, 11 and 2010 and 12. That's the latest data that we have on this. And um, very, only very marginal signs of improvements um, between those two time periods. Obviously, um, there is a lag in this data, and to know the full story for this <coughs> parliament, we need to wait for more recent data. That's the picture as we know it now. <coughs> so in terms of the challenges for the next government, um, up at the top of the list, not surprisingly, is the resources squeeze and the funding gap. So, um, OK, the government, um, we've got various... Um, the different political parties coming up with their different plans to address the 8 billion 2020 gap that's being widely discussed. Um, the new government will need to deal with these adverse movements against key indicators of healthcare access and quality. Um, these are really um, creating very widespread public perception of retrogression and going backwards with the healthcare system after many years of improvement. Um, and that will need to be dealt with. There's a widespread consensus that there's a need for transformational change. Um, transformational change in delivery will be necessary to increase productivity, and although productivity increases are not viewed as um, enough, there's going to need to be more money. Um, they are necessary. Um, so integration of health and social care, we'll be hearing a bit more about in a moment. Um, and other new mechanisms for service delivery. But there's also a need to address the demand side, um, obesity, smoking, alcohol, more preventative measures. The coalition's health reforms themselves raise significant challenges for policy implementation. So, as you know, we've had many multiple reforms implemented rapidly and simultaneously and on a compulsory basis, and as a result, we've got a myriad of new bodies. They're untested. They're in their infancy, so the new government will face the challenge of making those work, making sure they're fit for purpose. The new public service model that's been implemented by the coalition puts particular emphasis on a change role for the central state, focusing on minimum standards, outcomes and quality. That itself raises further challenges, assuming that the new government goes on along with that public services model. So on minimum standards, um, following the France's review. Um, there has been strengthening of regulation and minimum standards. Those need to be enforced and the system for management inspection and regulation needs to be effective. That will be an ongoing challenge for the next government. There's other challenges that we document in the paper on the, in, that relate to the overall framework of responsibility and accountability for improving health outcomes and reducing health inequalities. Um, and overall, um, in, the, in the next administration, Progress um, is, is going to be um, judged ultimately in terms of improving health outcomes and tackling inequality. So those will continue to be the key, key barometer of success or failure in the coming years. So I'm going to hand over now to Tanya, who's going to give us the context for some of the health pressures, um, which of course is the social care story. A linked, a linked and interactive story, really. We can't separate these two sets of services. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> 
<laughs> smooth transition into into thinking about adult and social care. Maybe that's a bit of a metaphor for the lack of integration between health and social care. One can't even move from one presentation to the other um, without, a, without a technical hitch. Um, I'm going to be focusing on, on adult social care rather than social care as a whole. Um, some of the aspects of, of children's services are being picked up in the parallel session um, across the way uh, by Kitty Stewart in her early years paper. I'm also principally focusing on England. Social care, as you know, is a, is a devolved policy area. Um, there's a little bit in the, in the full paper about Scotland and Wales, but um, I'm mainly going to be focusing on, on England. As, as Polly said, um, health was protected uh, in narrow cash terms, but not relative to most indicators of need and demand. Um, social care, however, was um, neither protected in terms of um, uh, cash nor... Uh, relative to demand. So we seem to have lost a slide in there, never mind. Um, so um, although uh, local government funding was cut by uh, a third, social care um, within that was relatively protected by local authorities, so local authorities chose to make larger cuts in other areas um, of their responsibility in order to protect frontline services. Uh, nevertheless, there was a real terms cut of uh, 13% in adult social care spending in England over this period. Uh, and spending on older people actually fell faster uh, within that. Um, as a result, um, fewer people were receiving uh, community-based services and, in fact, residential care uh, by the end of the period than at the beginning. So the numbers had been fairly stable through the um, this, is, this is people receiving community-based services, have been fairly stable through the uh, latter half of the 2000s before falling by 28% between um, 2009-10 and 2013-14. Uh, and the fall again particularly amongst those uh, over 65. The fall in numbers of people receiving services is actually greater than the fall in spending. And that's because there has been a concentration of um, effort or concentration of resources on those with the most intense needs. So as eligibility for services has been tightened, it's those with the less intensive needs um, that have become uh, excluded. The cuts in the number of users have been felt uh, across the board with the one exception of people with learning disability um, both amongst the working age population and the older population uh, their numbers receiving services have grown slightly over this period um, but all other groups have seen significant falls um, particularly uh, older people with a physical disability which is by far the largest group of adult social care users um, but some others um, also um, particularly interesting in the light of the findings that Polly's just presented on uh, suicide and mental health, a fall of over a third in the number of working age people with mental health problems receiving community services. And I think one can read this in, in at least two ways. Um, one is that that's a reflection of the higher levels, um, that, that the higher levels of, of need um, that uh, Polly has, has indicated um, are reflected here. Um, in the fall in the number of people receiving services. So in other words, the preventive aspect of community services is feeding through into poorer mental health outcomes. Um, but one can also see this as being um, an exacerbation of an existing problem. So if the recession was itself causing um, a, a deterioration in mental health at the same time as a squeeze on community health services, then we've really got a, a kind of double whammy. Uh, other groups, um, much smaller in terms of the overall uh, numbers of, of people um, and in terms of expenditure, but nevertheless potentially significant in terms of knock-on effects on other services, a halving of the number of people with substance misuse issues who are receiving services. And it seems very likely that we will see the effects of that not only in the healthcare system, but also in housing um, and indeed in the criminal justice system. It isn't a completely bleak, bleak picture, um, so there are um, key achievements in some areas. If we look at adult social care users survey, for example, um, there are improvements in six out of the seven indicators um, that the adult social care outcomes framework 
um, uses, including on uh, social care users' quality of life and their satisfaction with services. That, I think, nevertheless has to be put alongside uh, that, that picture of the people who have retained service entitlement doing uh, quite well and being pleased with the services that they're receiving has to be put alongside um, an increasing emerging body of evidence on um, the prevalence of poor quality care, both care in people's own homes and in residential care, and um, high levels of um, reported abuse. So uh, one of the areas, and why I've put this in as an achievement as opposed to um, uh, listing it as, as, as one of the deteriorating outcomes, I think one of the things that really has changed over this period is the awareness of the problems of poor standards in, in social care, um, partly as a result of, of um, panorama documentaries and so on, and partly because there is uh, more monitoring, more guidance, um, uh, and, and um, a closer scrutiny of, of standards and abuse. Um, and so that, in a sense, has brought to light things that were probably happening already, uh, but, but now we know about them. So 104,000 referrals for abuse of vulnerable adults in 2013-14, a really staggering number, I think. Um, and 43% of, of cases that were completed in 2013-14 were substantiated uh, cases. So that's about 38,000 vulnerable adults with confirmed abuse uh, in 2013-14. In and that's um, uh, backed up by the CQC's um, new inspection regime, which is finding problems, uh, serious areas of concern in one in five uh, nursing homes and one in ten uh, residential care um, uh, establishments and one in ten uh, domiciliary care providers. Another key achievement, which I'm not going to spend very much time talking about, but that's um, an important part of what the Coalition's legacy will be, is the reforms to... Uh, the funding of long-term care uh, introduced it following the Dilnot Commission, um, which has removed the more extreme financial consequences um, of uh, needing long-term care and will particularly benefit those with, with modest wealth um, in, in the years to come as it's, as it's implemented. It leaves, nevertheless, um, a, a five challenges for the incoming government. First of all... Um, the lack of integration of health and social care. Uh, so the, the, the current government did attempt to improve joining up with the Better Care Fund, for example, uh, but it was primarily driven by a um, cost-cutting agenda. Uh, and the National Audit Office report and other commentaries, for example, by the, the King's Fund, um, have highlighted that really that's putting the, the cart before the horse and that um, integration between health and social care will not necessarily make large budget savings straight away. Um, that may come further down the line. But to start with, there needs to be an investment in integration of health and social care um, and a much more a radical approach um, to reforming the systems that could enable that to happen. There are some emerging examples of good practice um, and I think one of the challenges for the incoming government is to see whether those can be scaled up um, and rolled out across other, other areas. Second is tackling the high prevalence of, of poor standards of care and abuse that I just mentioned, um, and creating conditions that enable real relationships of care to flourish uh, between carers and cared for. Uh, there's been coverage recently of the fact that three quarters of local authorities now commission some social care visits as short as 15 minutes. Um, so those are clearly not conditions in which relationships of care are likely to be built up. And connected very much with that, I think, is um, the need to invest in the social care workforce. Uh, the majority of do domiciliary care workers, the majority, 60%, are on zero-hour contracts. Um, a not insignificant number, 2.5%, I think, are paid below the national minimum wage, despite the fact that that's not legal, and very many more at the national minimum wage. And again, one has to ask whether those sorts of terms and conditions are compatible with creating the sort of um, quality of care um, that, that everybody thinks uh, should be achieved. High turnover of staff, obviously associated also with uh, those kinds of conditions, and the demands that are put on carers as well, has been identified by the CQC um, as a risk factor. There was reference in the overview um, this morning by, by John and Ruth um, to increasing unmet need. Um, that's absolutely right. And that we've seen uh, a significant increase in the number of unpaid carers um, over this period. We only have data here up to 2012-13. 
um, but the number of carers had gone up from 4.8 million in 2009-10 to 5.6 million in 2012-13. And there are also signs that more carers are providing more intensive care, so round-the-clock or long-hours um, care. And that clearly is not sustainable. Uh, that, that degree of increase in pressure on unpaid carers is clearly not sustainable um, going forward. Um, finally, um, the problem of reconciling further expected cuts and um, continued demographic pressure. And the Local Government Association has warned um, that the capacity of local government to absorb and protect um, frontline services, and particularly um, vulnerable people, um, has been exhausted. Um, this is the, the final chart. I had some long-winded title, but Bert Proben said, what you're trying to say here is more need, less money. And I think that does actually capture um, exactly of what the, the problem is facing, facing local government going forward. This is the LGA forecast for local government funding in the blue line, um, uh, the red line, the uh, forecast for the population aged 75+. plus. So just to finish, to remind you that we'd like to invite discussion on all three papers uh, now, housing, health and adult social care. Uh, we've tried to draw out some um, aspects which perhaps um, are, are in common across the, the areas. So given um, the, the state, of, uh, state of play, the capacity of these areas to absorb further increased demand uh, and further cuts um, has, has, we think, been uh, largely exhausted. The funding squeeze during the period of the coalition government uh, means that in particularly perhaps in, in housing and um, social care, there's um, ground to be made up, a period of um, underinvestment um, in the case of social care, in, in the workforce, in the case of housing, in the infrastructure, means there's significant ground to be, to be made up uh, in the next period. Pre-existing gaps in provision, none of these areas were of course uh, anything like perfect before the coalition came to power. Um, uh, still exist, and um, particularly uh, in the case of healthcare, significant inequalities remain. Uh, so those challenges are, are ongoing. Uh, the can needs to be kicked, has been kicked along the road, as, as Becky put it. Reductions in provision, particularly in housing and social care, mean that additional <coughs> risks, risks have been passed to, to individuals. So unpaid, the pressures on unpaid care, for example, or the fact that many people are living below uh, on, on incomes below benefit levels as a, re a result of reduction in, in housing benefit and increasing rents. And then finally, across the board, concerns about quality um, and minimum standards uh, that, that only serve to increase, unfortunately, the pressures uh, on, on cost. Thank Good. you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya. Good. Well, it's over to you now. Um, we'd very much like you to either comment ask further questions, probe a bit more, and rather than divide up the issues in, you know, between each of the subject areas, I think I'll simply ask for people to ask questions from whatever angle, whatever service they're interested in, and then we'll see if we can push some of them together and take the, frame the discussion a bit, but that depends a bit on what you're interested in. Uh, so I'll take about three questions together and then we'll see what direction they're heading. So just put your hand up and uh, help hold forth. One. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Two, three. OK, one. Yep. Hi, thanks. Um, my name's Beatrice. I just wondered if we can... Could you just say where you're coming from? I yeah, think sure. would help. Um, I work for a homeless charity called St. Margaret's Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered uh, if anyone could talk a bit more about any conclusions that we might be able to draw if we about the link between cuts to capital grants for housing and the rise in the housing benefit bill? Mm. Mm. Uh, who's the second one? Here, yes. Um, right, I'm, I'm a trustee of a small local based charity and yeah. my interest is very much how the interaction between government policies and the local authorities are coming out and what the picture is that you're getting because obviously we're seeing your overall picture just wondering how much different local authorities are handling these things in my terms better or worse. And in a sense, you can see where I'm going. It's about how much preventative work we should be thinking about and where we should be thinking about putting our money to the best use. Yeah. 
Somewhere over here, yes. Me, uh, hi. Um, I've just and where you're coming from? Yes, I've, ju I've just started to work at yep. a new research centre in Oxford where we're going to be doing some work which overlaps a little with, with what you're doing. Uh, so we're trying to track how we're doing as a nation, the social progress, perhaps we're looking for a longer time period than, than you have been doing. But one of the, it's a bit of a self-interested question. One of the questions I've been thinking about and grappling with is whether the um, government national well-being uh, measures, um, are they purely idealistic and a bit of a front to show the world, or do you think they can realistically have an impact on what we're talking about here, particularly thinking, for example, I, I mean, <clears throat> obviously it's not just sub subjective well-being, but mental health would have a huge impact on the subjective well-being measures. So is this a, is this a possible lever ever in the future to, to, to see the improvement. Mm, well, uh, well why, why don't we start, why don't we try and structure this a bit, housing, okay. is, uh, well, you, get, you get going on that. Thanks, that's a very clear housing specific question, but I think in fact that, that point about um, the link between the changes in the funding for social housing, perhaps the abolition of the idea of social housing, and knock-on costs for housing benefit are uh, a sort of case in point of some of the things that we heard about in the overall presentation. So it's too early to say, um, because there isn't yet a significant amount of new style affordable social housing out there. Um, but we can also predict quite clearly in this case what the consequences will be um, for housing benefit. Um, we know that um, a substantial proportion of people are paying these higher rents will have to do so through housing benefit. You can see the knock-on costs. And in fact, they've already been quantified. Um, and if you look at that over a sort of 20-year period, um, it's a substantial amount. I'm going to really struggle. It's in the report. It's about 15 billion, um, just looking at the affordable housing bill rate we've got for a moment. So this is a, a case of uh, you know, issues kicked down the road and costs that will come. So, there are you know, only so many ways you can pay for things to happen. And if you don't pay them out one budget, they may end up coming out of another budget. But Becky, what about the, to pick up a bit yes. on the next bit, which yes. was about local government and local mm -hmm. government's response to central <laughs> issues. I know there's partly, I think you were talking about social care, but it overlaps with the housing it's issue. Them, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I think that the overall issue about um, whether or not TINA applies, applies again at this level. So th there is an alternative. There are options at national government level. There are options at local government level. And different local authorities have responded in different ways. Um, unfortunately, we're probably not quite the right team because we've been mainly looking at national level. But well, I think the, yeah. the, the, we've, we've done some parallel work um, looking at three case study boroughs within London um, that's on the Social Policy and Cold Climate website, by a report by Fitzgerald and colleagues, um, that's, that's trying to track um, at a local level, differentiating between different local government strategies in responding to, um, to, to the cuts and, and to the economic climate. Um, so I mean, that is London specific, um, but I think it illustrates quite well some of the different strategies. If you want to say more yeah, about that. Yeah, I'm just colleagues. seeing Holly Holder there. Yeah. I think there's the Nuffield mm -hmm. Foundation report on health and wellbeing for Nuffield Trust. Nuffield Trust, um, sorry. Well. Not on health and wellbeing, but we did look a little bit at the, um, the variation in how the local governments have responded to the cuts that they've received. And it is, in terms of social care, the variation is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And it's got a lot to do with um, the demographics in the area, how many people classify as being eligible, so how, many, how much private money they can get into the system. Mm -hmm. And it does link also with the pressures in the hospitals in the area. Mm -hmm. So. So, yes, there is a report on our website. There's also a national thing. audit office um, evaluation of how local governments are um, dealing with their new public health responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, and that's showing a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's um, on alcohol, um, the preventative measures around alcohol, they're finding that um, the local authorities with the biggest problems weren't the ones targeting yeah. the most money, and they were highlighting that as a problem. Mm -hmm. and also raising, um, you know, whether the powers of Public Health England were sufficient, um, given the variation that's arising. So two sources there. One's uh, the case website on London, and then um, 
your website? Could you just yeah, mine. Yes. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the Nuffield Trust, and it's um, a, a quality watch education okay. on adult social care. Yeah, might as well do some spreading of the word <laughs> <laughs> across the board. A couple of other things. The New Policy Institute's done something looking at local government's responses to its new responsibility for council tax benefit. There's very diverse um, approaches there which have a big impact on, on people's incomes and, and expenditures on cases. And there's been a little bit of work done by Inside Housing looking at how local authorities can, have used their new discretion over allocations in social housing and very diverse patterns. Okay, now, Tanya, if you... Well, I, I thought perhaps Polly might be in the best position to respond to the question about subjective well-being. Ah, oh, yes, well, so one or other of you on the well-being yes, specialists, so yes. We didn't, we didn't include the well-being indicators in the health report, um, but they are out there. Um, we highlighted the suicide and mental health figures and put quite a lot of emphasis on those. And um, certainly looking at European um, data it does seem like the happiness data um, has not um, experienced um, the same collapse, um, shall we say. Um, so there's, there's not the same adverse movements at the European level in the ha happiness data as there is in the mental health data, for example. So um, it does raise issues about some of the subjective well-being and happiness and life satisfaction um, data and, and whether that's kind of responding to um, signs of social dislocation and stress in the same way that the mental health data would respond. I think it very much ties in with what we've seen in the social care field that if you look at the social care users survey, um, the um, reported satisfaction with services has increased over this period. Um, and if, yet if you look at possibly more objective indicators of, of quality, such as the CQC r reports or the um, series on um, uh, adults uh, referred for um, uh, possibly being victims of, of abuse, um, they move in a quite different direction. I think it would be very much our view from the work that we've done that you need to put subjective and objective indicators side by side to get the whole picture. Uh, and, and one set of indicators are done by the broad population who may or may not have had a mentally ill person yeah. part of that. So there's a, there's a focus on, on ex extreme responses and problems and a broad general service of the whole population seems to be another I, yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, um, shouldn't be intervening myself, should I? Um, <laughs> so that's, that, uh, did, uh, have you got a response to this last point or do you want to come back on the wellbeing issue? Um, it's, just, it's just, I could go on for hours. Um, I've, <laughs> Spotted as well, I know that life satisfaction hasn't really shifted, which really raises the question of the, the, the value of life satisfaction, particularly because if it's seen in relative terms, someone else's misery is, is to my increased satisfaction, it might be a zero sum game. Um, so I think that's interesting. Um, but then just to come back on, do you think that these well being measures will be taken seriously by government? Have they got any potential <coughs> to influence? Policy. And of course, they're not just measuring subjective well being, no, they're no, also no. measuring material mm. well being, yeah. housing, mm. you know, they've, they've got sort of eight or ten domains. Yes. So the, the well being indicator has really improved, yeah. in our view, yeah. um, and much happier with how yeah. it is now. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, yeah. so I do think it's got a role and it is important, it's not yeah. that we're against it, um, but it, it just needs to be very well carefully formulated and also careful with composite indicators and, yeah. and general population trends rather than looking at inequality. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that was, uh, that was probably my conclusion as well, that we need, always need to focus on inequality. I'm sure there are other... Let's, let's, <laughs> you can continue this yeah. well-being yeah. discussion yeah. afterwards. <laughs> uh, three, three more. One. One person at the back. Two. Three. OK. Yep. Um, Carol uh, Hayden, and I'm going to talk about from the, from um, from work I've been doing with Shared Intelligence Research Consultancy, right. and um, going back to the issue around, say, health and wellbeing boards. I mean, we did some research for the local government association on those, and that and other research I've done with individual areas, um, particularly around long-term health conditions, really is raising a lot of issues with I think what was called in the plenary session the sort of wiring or the plumbing um, in terms of where decision making and financial decisions are made. One of the things we found in terms of the work of health and wellbeing boards is there really was no link 
with um, CCGs. So, um, which, which, which made that you were make, made you could make strategic decisions based on a JSNA um, in terms of health needs, by population groups, looking at wider issues like quality of life, but actually using that to influence the commissioning decisions of the CCG or NHS England were really, really difficult. At the same time, moving um, the responsibility for public health to local authorities from the NHS um, seems, and I mean, this is anecdotal based on a number of specific areas we've done research with, but although it strengthened some of the links between public health and adult social care, it's actually made some of the links between public health and the preventative agenda with the NHS and CCGs actually more difficult. So it feels that a lot of CCGs, which we've also done other research with, some of them, are still playing out the, you know, the tension that's been going on for ages between the acute sector, health sector, with quite a lot of dominance by clinical consultants, um, and any sort of, not just preventative agenda, which is important, but I suppose wider support agenda for people, particularly with, say, long-term health conditions, which might need, who might need support from voluntary sector, adult social care, um, and a, carers, and a whole range of support, which would be really important to, um, uh, you know, qual um, healthy life expectancy. So your question is... Well, it's a sort of bit of a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely fine. So, I mean, absolutely fine. Uh, it, it's really about the... the we didn't talk much about reorganisation, but re reorganisation might be impinging, for good or ill, quick question on these issues of mental health and other public health issues. Yeah, somebody at the back, wasn't there? Yeah, David. David, David yes. Uh, I wanted to ask what you thought about the sustainability of what's happened in relation to human resources and the and the, and the freezes and pressure that been put on, 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 on the human resources, that, uh, that the yeah. only way a lot of the cuts have been sustained seems to me that, that, that more and more people are on very low wages and uh, uh, in the future that, that, that you, can't, you can't keep squeezing the public sector like that without something giving. And, uh, and, and so how far is, 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 is as a short-term, medium-term ability to squeeze costs uh, are going to be sustainable, but if it isn't, um, then, then um, the, the, the forecast sums in relation to needs are going to be a whole lot uh, more um, limited than, than, the, than, than what, what, what's been described for the coalition years, or this co uh, the present coalition years. Yeah, reaction, yes. Um, Elizabeth Hull. Um, for the last 40 years, the budget between health and social care has been amalgamated in Northern Ireland. Have you looked uh, at whether that, in fact, induces less pressure on the NHS than in England, where the tendency is going to be on amalgamation of the two budgets? Okay, uh, well let's start with um, that first observation about reorganisation in the health service and its impact on links and so on. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, it, it's interesting that that's what you found and, you know, and it is a challenge for the next government, whoever's, whoever's in government, to get the new bodies working together and it's quite... Um, depressing really to hear that the CCGs and the health and wellbeing boards aren't working mm -hmm. in an integrated way and that that's your observation and trying to get the new bodies to work as intended is it obviously is going to fall to the to the next government just on um, pay freezes and things um, David's point um, I, I think there's so it certainly come out in the King's Fund report on productivity and the NHS five year forward view that it's unsustainable to rely on um, wage freezes um, in order to get productivity gains that are needed um, and that other measures um, such as service transformation and just demand side measures will be necessary. Um, so I think there is recognition that um, just having wage freezes as a, as a key tool um, 
will run out of steam and it won't be possible to go on like that. Um, and then the um, integrated health and social care in Northern Ireland, we haven't looked at that, but that would be an interesting thing to go on to look at, so thank you. Yes, it's not just a strain on, on productivity. You can get productivity in a period where you've got a, a big previous budget. Mm -hmm. And as David's point is, that you've got a, a pressure on people mm -hmm. now. It's not just wages, it's pre pressure on people. Mm -hmm. It's going to explode at some point. There's a point at which the pot, the person, can't cope with anymore. OK, right, now the... Uh, the uh, Tanya, you wanted to come yes, back on some uh, of this. Well, on, on David's point really yep. about the sustainability of, of human resources, I think certainly in the, in the area of social care that's that's a, a major concern in, in, in two ways. One, um, the people who aren't paid at all, the, the unpaid carers, um, that I think uh, there's emerging evidence, again, there's a lag in the data because this is survey data, um, but it certainly suggests that both the numbers of carers mm -hmm. and the hours that they're doing is increasing um, mm -hmm. and as further uh, cuts are introduced to eligibility for formal services, one can only expect that that pressure is going to increase. And um, although there was quite a bit of rhetoric at the beginning of the coalition period about increasing support for carers, very little has materialised in practice over this period. So I think that's certainly going to be a big um, part of what the incoming government needs to address. Uh, but then secondly, in terms of the paid workforce, um, it, as you know, the social care relies very heavily on a um, a migrant um, workforce and an extremely low paid uh, workforce working under considerable pressure. I mean, <laughs> having a 15 minute appointment is pretty bad for the person who has to receive the, um, who has to be got out of bed and help to dress and, and wash and have their breakfast within 15 minutes. But it's also pretty tough on the person who's supposed to deliver care in that um, sort of way and then move on to the next person and do it again and so on. So I think. And the pressure both in terms of wages and in terms of the sort of intensity of work and the number of um, uh, cases that, that social care workers are having to, to undertake is, is probably not sustainable, sustainable either. And, and as you said, David, that just means that the figures on, uh, that I put up on um, more need and less money are, are even worse um, than that picture suggests because the, the real cost is, is, going to be, is going to be higher still. Just, just to add something yes, on that, on. Um, from the point of view of the housing world, some of these strains are, are measurable or measured to some extent because there are agencies involved that take part in this. And so if you think about um, benefit sanctions and, and housing benefit cuts for individual households, mm -hmm. um, some of the strain is borne by those households and they change their budgets and they borrow from their friends and they mm -hmm. eat less and so on. But some of the strain is also picked up by their landlords and um, landlords have been private and, and social and have been very concerned about this and have put a considerable amount of money into trying to manage the situation, help people get by on, on less. But rent arrears nationwide in, in all sectors have been rising over this period and, and the, the effects are still coming through. So you can quantify this to, to some extent, but we should be very wary of the fact that in some areas you can see this happening um, in number terms and others you can't. It depends on what agencies are available to look at that. I think the picture of housing associations is the biggest, the most rich voluntary organisations is, is salutary. As, as I mentioned earlier, that there's a limit to how much they can do, even as extremely rich organisations. And then if we think about some of the strains that are coming on the household sector, on smaller voluntary agencies, those are difficult to pick up, um, but we should not forget them and watch out for them. I've got a bit more time if uh, there are some more questions. One, two, Three. All right, one. Well, yes. Uh, maybe, maybe like to work with just on that point, really Could you say that again? I missed it. I work for London's heavy labour. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, 
Why don't you answer that straight away? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know the answer, um, but uh, I, I know that the research on, on individuals shows that um, a lot of people are hoping that the policy will go away, so they hope that their tax will be cancelled, or that they, you know, organisations also hope that there may be reverses to changes. So people are sort of pinning their hopes on a change that may not come, and whether they can keep going beyond that is difficult to say. But I would have to turn some of this back on, on to you. We, you know, I don't know what your organisation's books look like and um, what your assets and resources are. Um, but certainly, if you were to spend more of your assets and resources on dealing with rent and and, and helping people um, survive on low incomes, you wouldn't be spending them on new house building, and that's a, a real concern. So the resources can only be spent in certain ways. Right, the second question. Yes? Yeah, um, Steve Kerr from Trust for London. It's kind of a broad question that cuts across the whole set of reports because in these three areas too. And just we often hear about early action um, as a as kind of a solution to some of this in terms of um, improving effectiveness of services and, and avoiding crisis situations. I'm just wondering um, what what scope you really see um, uh, in terms of you know, cost savings or you know, improving the functioning of the system through early action in a broad sense, and also um, whether that's um, whether that's feasible kind of politically and economically in, in, in the fiscal kind of climate that we have going forward, given that um, it's not a not a recipe for immediate cost savings. Uh, well, will take one more. T take the second question, then we can deal with them together. Yep. Oh, okay. My name is Alison, I'm from, I work for a systems and hospital. Um, my question, with more an observation to invite comments on, is housing benefit has gone up, the cost of it, uh, but a lot of the winners from that will be private landlords, and I wondered about the impact on inequality of that, because it's people that own property that are gaining from this increased need. Um, and a, just a second observation was about mental health and how the lack of facilities for people suffering me mental health issues uh, is probably having a knock-on effect with things like the police. And um, I speak partly from personal experience. My son is a policeman, and they have said that they are seeing an increased number of people with mental health needs. And I see that as a very expensive way of dealing with mental health needs. Yes. Can you can you answer that or well, respond to that first, and then we'll go on to this sort of broader question of what what next, given the circumstances, financial circumstances. Yeah. Um, on that question about housing housing benefits um, and what we're putting our national resources into, um, housing benefits supports people to stay in homes. It supports own, owners to rent them out. Um, it doesn't support the building of new homes unless it's a sort of future incentive. But this system has been in place for, for many decades. Um, it, it was a Conservative government before the previous Labour government that said housing benefit will take the strain of the changes to housing policy. So we, we're just seeing the same sort of thing. Things have cranked up a bit more with the, the welfare reforms changes that are going on at the moment in an attempt to deal with that. But there is this structural issue. Um, I think overall we need to look at the, the tax treatment um, of, of housing and the way that um, resources flow around the system, the tax treatment of being a private landlord, or being a private tenant, is an area that will, will probably be looked at by the next government. Right, now let's deal with, um, as it were, the tensions in the future, really. Um, all of you could have a go. Tanya, why don't you start then, Paul? Yes, well, I'm particularly picking up on your point about early action. I think um, I see this as being real tension in the Care Act 2014 between, um, as far as social care is concerned, on a strong um, exhortation to um, engage in more preventative uh, care. So a um, uh, whole new set of statutory responsibilities around um, uh, preventative care, so early action to prevent people acquiring needs that may be more expensive to um, cater for later. But at the same time, introducing a national min minimum eligibility threshold that's actually higher. So in other words, the, the, the level at which people become entitled to services um, by local government actually being effectively raised. 
Um, so that, that leaves a kind of big gap between the point of, of um, prevention before you have substantial care needs and then needing to have very substantial care needs before you become eligible for services. Whereas in reality, of course, people's needs are on a spectrum right through from the preventative through low level needs through to the more intense needs. And there seems to have been this, this um, hollowing out um, uh, and a focus on, on prevention on the one hand and very intense support on the other and quite what's supposed to happen to the people in the middle. Um, is left is left uncertain. So I think, yes, there is scope for thinking more about um, preventative measures in social care, and in fact, coming back to this question about the variation between local government's mm -hmm. responses um, in the, the London um, borough case studies that we did, the, there was variation in practice between councils in, in how much they've gone down the preventative route as a means of trying to balance their books. Um, so I think there is interesting sort of potential there um, but again, it needs to be seen not primarily in, or in the first instance, I think, as a cost-saving or cost-cutting measure, um, but something in order to get the service to work well. And then the savings may come further down the line, but, it, but it's uh, at the moment being introduced um, with, with quite, I think, with the wrong kind of framework, if you like, to, to make a success of it. Yeah, um, yes, I agree that in, um, ideally we'd be moving to preventative public health um, system and um, there has been some attempt to do that with the new um, responsibilities for local government in public health and so the government has acknowledged that in a sense but we've been hearing about the problems of implementation and getting that system to work and there's also other um, worries um, of our local government um, goals sufficiently um, aligned with uh, public health, England goals, for example, as I mentioned before, and whether all the levers that are necessary are genuinely in local hands or whether there is central action, more central action that um, needs to happen, so sugar taxes and standardised cigarette packaging and things like that, whether that would be a genuine thing that local government could do. Um, the um, mental health issue, I was just going to um, refer to the suicide in um, prisons figures that are also out this week and um, there seems to be a big increase in suicide in prisons so another sign of um, pressure on the mental health system. Just a point to add on, on um, prevention in housing, I didn't mention this but there's been substantial work on trying to prevent people becoming homeless uh, both under this, this coalition and the previous government and that has had some impact. Um, but it, it, it hasn't been able to stop the rise in both people claiming their rights as homeless people with local authorities and being accepted quite dramatic increases over the, the coalition period. So again, it's this question about whether the need is rising or whether it's the production of resources that is driving things, but I think both are there. One other quick point on, on housing, which is sort of using the preventative model, but perhaps um, sort of stretching the metaphor a bit, um, both Labour and Conservative parties talked about this idea before the election but didn't put it into their manifestos and it hasn't come through in, in policy um, they talked about how you shouldn't waste a good crisis and in housing terms um, it's cheap to buy land, it's cheap to buy labour um, during a downturn um, and it, in one argument is this is an area where if you want to make a national investment it's a good time and place to do it in terms of jobs and knock on or benefits, um, that choice wasn't taken. Okay, um, I think I'm going to put an end, as it were, to the formal proceedings, and these three will be around uh, for a little bit longer to answer questions if you want to come up and buttonhole them. Uh, but thank you very much for those contributions. They're helpful to everybody, I think. Um, spread the ideas and knowledge around a bit. So thank you very much for that, and do go and... There's some spare copies of the full reports here. If you want to take them, they're on the website. Uh, so you can go to the case website and download any of them, including the London. Yes. They're now on. They're on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.